Chloe. So we're going to talk about mass spectrometry today. We talked about gas chromatography the other day. One of the instruments that a gas chromatograph is commonly attached to is a mass spectrometer, just like uh, LC, liquid chromatography. And the mass spectrometer is a really good device, a follow-up device, to provide uh, primarily the identity of un unknown compounds. That's its, its primary purpose. And so sometimes you're doing simply identification. Sometimes you're actually looking for determining the structure of that molecule as well. Quantifying known compounds, that's what I showed you last time, is that you don't have to separate two peaks by chromatography if, in fact, you've got a mass spectrometer on the end. If these two peaks, you know, they look together, they look perfect like one peak. But if there's as much as five hundredths of a second difference, the mass spectrometer can separate those two and draws you a curve for one and draws you a curve for the second peak, your second component. And, you know, there's many places to go. Uh, the Internet's a wonderful source of information, tutorials and so on, uh, to learn about the technique. But at one time, it was primarily a research technique. It's Now it's really commonplace in uh, food laboratories. Price has gone down. The expertise or need has gone down to <laughs> know quite as much as they did before. <laughs> so it's um, say it's really good a good tool. Uh, this is just a list of some of the applications for mass spectrometry. Uh, so these are very specific, such as identify the use of steroids in athletes. Okay, so checking on our the drugs being used. Monitor the breath of patients by anesthesiologists during surgery. See a little mass spectrometer sitting next to you as you're taking a nap. Check in for your blood component. I'm sorry, breath components. Determine composition of molecules found in space. You mentioned whether honey is adulterated in corn syrup. Locate a little deposits by measuring petroleum precursors. Minor ferment, monitor fermentation for biotechnology. I could go on for page after page after page, literally, of where mass spectrometry has come in. As I said at one time, this was a technique only used by few, and now it's used by many. It's simply become a routine tool. <clears throat> and, uh, well, we're getting two lectures on this, and lecture number one is today is going to be primarily hardware. What is a mass spectrometer? What are different parts of a mass spectrometer? Where do you use these uh, different parts or different combinations? So that will be primarily for today. And this is a new slide if you happen to have an old one, because uh, I wanted them to continue with hardware, but then get into applications more. Um, I see people using mass spectrometers, and they get a number, just like they get a numbered gas chromatography, and they take that number and run and say, wonderful. And that's not necessarily the case. You got to know how the mass spectrometer works. You got to know what it measured. Because it'll give you all kinds of bad information, <laughs> lots and lots and lots. If it doesn't have the data it needs, it makes a guess. And that guess can be completely wrong. And so the idea that doing a few applications, I think, are, are useful. So that's when I'm slipping in to, uh, to Wednesday's lecture. So getting into the hardware of the system, um, these are the three primary parts. First part is the source. The source is where actually uh, molecules coming into the system are bombarded, bombarded high energy electrons, typically and most commonly high energy electrons, but energy is transmitted, blows them into bits. And then you pick the pieces up and try to put the puzzle back together. The machine does that for you. So it's uh, first part is, like I say, blowing things up. Then, okay, let's uh, take all those pieces that just blew your molecule into, starts organizing them, positive charge, negative charge, no charge, and starts counting them for you. And so now let's take a tabulation of what was uh, generated. The mass analyzer does the separation of these fragments, and the detector then, like I say, does the quantification, puts a uh, patterns together. This pattern, very unique typically, it could be diacetyl, it could be the pattern of, of dairy flavor, butter flavor, and so on. But anyway, the instrument has that ability to put these pieces back together and give you a spectrum. And that spectrum is what you work with to do your identifications. This is uh, the oldest mass. It is the oldest? Yes, it is the oldest mass spectrometer. Um, it's called 
a magnetic sector instrument. And so all of your mass spectrometers have some way, of course, of generating or blowing your particle of interest into pieces. This one should show us high energy electrons. Okay, so your sample is coming in here. Your sample passes through high energy electrons, blows them into bits, and then it has an accelerating plate that draws out only a, a certain charge ion, comes out here, and it's, it's bent. It's bent by a magnetic field. At a low magnetic field, you bend around the smallest molecules to make it measured out here. And the magnetic field increases, 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 so you're continuously focusing, focusing larger molecules around that bend where they get counter. So you've got the three parts, the source, the mass analyzer, and finally down here, your collector or detector. So those are the three parts of all mass spectrometers. And so let's, let's start with uh, one of the most common uh, types of mass spectrometer. That's electron impact. That's essentially what I was showing in the past one. So here we have electron beams. So that's our source, it's electron beam. That uh, blows a molecule up. There are other ways to blow molecules up. This is just one of them. This is the oldest and really the most common uh, mass spectrometer in the industry today. Ideally, a pure compound gets into that source area. Doesn't always have to be a pure compound, it can be a mixture, darn it. But hopefully, your compound coming into that ion beam is a pure compound. And then that's essentially where we, we blow it up. How do we get uh, this into the ion source and be bombarded by energy? You can actually have a little vent on the side of the mass spectrometer where you take your, your sample, you put it in a little glass tube, and then you take that and shove it into the mass spectrometer. So it's in the ion beam and your eyes hit it. And we have our, our molecules, fragments being generated. So a direct probe has to be a pure compound. If you've got a pure compound, you want to know what it is. Put a little bit of that probe, stick it in, and you get a spectrum. And the mass spectrometer will tell you what it thinks it is. Gas chromatography, I don't know, maybe we got five mass spectrometers down in our lab. And so this is most common for us, but to put a GC on the beginning of it. So, okay, you put a mixture in, theoretically, you know, one compound comes out of the column at a time, goes to the mass spectrometer, gets blown up, and, and common. Or high performance liquid chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography. And so if we evolve the compounds, we can introduce this into our mass spectrometer by gas chromatography. Non-volatiles, taste components, whatever, so they're not volatile, you will put them through an HPLC and you blow them apart and the piece of simulation. So we're generally looking for hitting high energy. What are many bonds? Many like, um, bonds in a molecule are less than 10 electron volts. We hit it with 70. We put enough energy, like I say, to, to simply blow. And so that's most common to use a very high energy play in many pieces. There are some cases where we actually use a low energy, about 20 electrons. And the difference is if you got 70 electron volts, you blow this thing into bits, lots of pieces. If you hit it with 20, you might only blow one little piece off. So you got oftentimes the ability to see the intact compound, the paired compound, with little or no fragmentation. So it's just easier to measure something, easier to look at the total structure here than it is when you got lots of lots of little pieces. So that's our electron impact. High energy, as I said, at that point, we get good fragmentation. We blow it into lots of pieces, a lot of fragments. It's easier then to look at that fragment, oh, that's that. This is other small fragments, easy. Oh, I know what this is, and so on. So you can put them together. And so good fragmentation actually makes identification easier. If we do this, though, the high energy blow lots of pieces, we may not see the parent ion. Who's the parent ion? <laughs> the parent is your compound with a positive charge. It's not been exploded at all. Just blew an electron off it. <laughs> okay. And so it's kind of nice if you see a parent ion and you say, oh, the parent ion is 136. I know my molecule has a molecular weight of 136. 
So I can get molecular weight off this. That's a nice starting point for identification, knowing the molecular weight of what you're looking for. But basically, high energy, you won't, may not see the parent line. And it also doesn't form a lot of ions, so you lose sensitivity. So it's not quite a sensitive rate for identification, particularly the parent ion molecular weight. Low energy, we see their molecular weight, and it tends to be more sensitive. So we'll use either one of these. And this is by far the workhorse. Load it to bits and put it back, back together. The positive ion, or I guess I just defined that, the positive ion of the unfragmented molecule, the intact molecule, is called the, the parent ion. And it can also be called the molecular ion. So that's the impact compound. The base ion, and these are terms that you'll, you'll see. Okay, I got a parent ion of this. There's a base peak of this. It's kind of the jargon that people use when they talk about mass spectrometry. What's your base peak? Your base peak is the biggest, I shouldn't say biggest, it's the most abundant fragment. So we've got some really stable parts of a molecule. They don't get fragmented as much. And so we have some structure there that ends up being the most biggest or the largest quantity of fragments. So it's the most abundant ion that your molecule is blown into. And your base peak runs from 0 to 100. That's a, a, a little bit different than in many other areas when we start thinking about how you count these things. What you have is you have your base peak, that's your largest peak. In this chloral set of chemone, your, my base peak is 105. That's the most abundant triangle that this molecule got rolled into. So this molecule is in electrons. This is the most common or most abundant fragment. That's given a value of 100%. This has 100, what, 139 is the mass of this particular fragment. And so that's based on the size of this one. So this might be 75. So this is 100, this is 75, this may be 20. So everything, all of these pieces are based or scaled on what's your most abundant fragment. So what is your, your base peak? And this gives you, I guess, the structure of what this molecule gets blown into. If it you know, blow, gets blown up really well, it ends up being a benzene ring. So that's one of the pieces right here. You may end up having your benzene ring plus your C double bond O. Okay, that's a mass of 105. This mass down here, this fragment will blow into, is up here, 139 total benzene. And if it's just uh, here, which is a little chlorine ring, it has a mass of 111. So you kind of see the structure of each of these cancers from coming from the molecule. So it's, it's interesting to be able to do that and be able to look at them and say, hey, here are my pieces. This is uh, illustrating the difference between a high energy um, impact, so blowing it into lots of little pieces. So this is our molecule, pentobarbital. This, if you hit it with high energy, your fragments, its mass is 226. So that's the pair. That's the molecular weight of this top one. But you don't see anything up there because it's hitting high energy. There are no impact <clears throat> molecules. So what you see is really a fragment of 156 and 141 and some other bits and pieces. If we would do the low energy, the 20 electron volts, what do we see? That doesn't blow it up very much into small pieces. We find a mass of 227. So M plus one, mass plus 100. So here's our intake molecule, and I got a peak front. I know molecular weight is exceedingly helpful in my identifications. So that's electron impact. Like I say, that tends to be the workhorse of what we do, certainly in the foods business, that's the workhorse by far. And if you get into research other areas, there are other ways to, to blow this molecule into pieces. <laughs> so these are other techniques that are used. MALDI, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization is one way of blowing the molecules up. And you'll see what each of these are. 
Electrospray ionization, that's commonly used to, to interface with liquid chromatography. So that's the most common here. DESI, direct, direct electrospray ionization, DART, direct analysis in real time, FAB, fast atom bombardment. So different ways of blowing your molecule into bits. So they interface with different instruments. None of these, well, no, none of these will actually interface with the gas chromatograph. This will interface with liquid chromatograph. These are all standalone methodologies. There's nothing feeding them. And one of these uh, systems is used in airports. If you're looking at drug screening, what that person does with that swab, puts it in this mass spectrometer that happens to be sitting there. Okay, looking for uh, bomb dust, so to speak. And so let's look at each of these, give you an idea of what each of these types of ionization are for. Baldy, high molecular weight analytes and analysis of proteins. So I'm going to show you some proteins doing mass spectrometry on intact proteins. Peptides, glycoproteins, oligosaccharides, dioligonucleotides, and so on. So some application. I use this for chilling and flavors reactive proteins. We've got a lot of research going on in the, in the PPIC group and the protein research group. I'm interested in how flavors react with proteins. And so I can take my protein, I can add a flavor, like a nice cherry flavor to it. Cherry flavor is primarily benzaldehyde, single chemical. If you smell benzaldehyde or taste it, you'll say cherry, absolutely. And so I will put a cherry flavor in with the protein, maybe it's a high protein beverage. That benzaldehyde is gonna react with the protein. It's gonna actually form covalent bonds. My flavor is gonna be disappearing. It's being swallowed up literally by the protein. And so I'm really interested in that because the idea that my flavor is going away, that doesn't work very well for the consumer, gives us a lot of you know, shorter shelf life. And so we spend a lot of time, or we have recently, trying to understand how flavors react. I can do this by mass spectrometry. And like I say, you'll get a, uh, an example a little bit later on. So for MALDI, this matrix assisted laser desorption technique, the sample is mixed, pre-mixed with high energy absorbing cop. So you're gonna take your sample, you can introduce it by liquid chromatography also. But one technique is you mix it with absorbing compound. You hit that compound with a laser. That laser literally bolts everything into, not everything, but it blows that matrix into bits. When it blows it into bits, that matrix gives a charge to my protein. So my protein picks up a charge from the matrix it's in. Very little decomposition of it. We tend to see it most of the time just a parent ion, no fragments to it. Let's say you will get a, a more of an example of that later later on, but it's something we use for our protein reactions. Um, this gives a diagram of that that process. Here's our matrix that has our sample in it. We hit that in high energy laser beam, forms bits, fragments, positive charge, negative charge, not charge. But we have charged materials, we put an electric potential around this. It's going to drag its possibly charged fragments out, and the focus them here onto the detector. So a really simple technique, nice technique, you love it because there's almost no sample preparation. It is a very soft ionization proceed process. Soft, I'm saying we don't blow it into lots of pieces. We basically just try to get one charge onto our mass. Our intact molecule picks up one charge. That's our that's our goal. Then it's easy. If there's not a lot of fragments. Oh, here's the molecular weight. Well, oh, that happens to beta lact be beta lactoglobulin. It's a milk protein. I can tell that from from the mass spectrometer. Uncharged emits. It is limited in molecular weight because we only get one charge per atom. And they're big, 18,000, 30,000, 50,000 molecular weight. It's tough to get them extracted out of the system going down a flight tube to be measured. 
So we can go up to something like 50,000 molecular weight. Uh, but if we want to look at a big protein, a big plant protein, 100,000, 200,000, the technique doesn't, doesn't work for us. This is one example. This is a very, very, no, it's not a small protein. We're down here. 2,000, oh, it's 2,466. So that's kind of small, small material. What is it? Doesn't, doesn't say. Okay. But it's a very, very small bit, 2,466. That's uh, probably in the category of a peptide. Here's what we do with the flavor protein reaction. If we take beta lactoglobulin, beta lactoglobulin has a mass of 18,263, I believe. And so we can put our sample, uh, I've reacted with a flavor, whatever else, put into this matrix, zap it, and then look at what I put a charge on. And so this would be alpha lactoglobulin, beta lactoglobulin. This is a dimer for some dimerization. Here I've got lactose. Lactose is reacting with my protein. And so what I'm really interested in is there will be another little shoulder that's from putting flavor molecule on that material. This is beta lactoglobulin and vanilla. Or vanilla. So I'm putting vanilla flavor in with beta lactoglobulin. And so I'll get a protein here, my beta lactoglobulin. I'll get another little peak out here. So that other little peak right here was this material plus vanilla. There isn't much of it because vanilla doesn't react a great deal with, with proteins. But I've got a tiny, tiny peak here that shows I've actually got a chemical bonded onto my beta lactoglobulin, my protein. So that's the technique we use a fair amount, but again, it isn't the best. The best is still still common. Fast atom bombardment, FAB is what it's called. Bombardment by a fast particle beam, high energy beam. Before we hit it with electrons, okay, now we nail it with something else, though so much higher energy. <clears throat> Let's put again your samples put in the matrix and it's hitting a very high energy beam. And that can be a neurogas, argon, xeon, argon, four to ten thousand kilovolts. So four to ten thousand electron volts. The particle beam transfers much of its energy to the matrix again, just a little different energy, a little different way it's done. And light's ejected off the surface. And I think I have a, a diagram of that that maybe makes more sense for you. Secondary ions, so again, what ions, ions are formed, get analyzed by the mass spectrometer. So this is um, the fast atom on movement. So here's our matrix. Here's our sample. We get this atoms actually coming in, not electrons, but actually high energy atoms. It's this transfers energy and it gives off fragments or pieces of this molecule that again get drawn on the machine to count it up there. So again, as I said, this is one of the things that uh, can be done at airports. There's easier ways to do it. This is a, another type of ionization. So here we have a, a nitrogen gas coming in. There'll be some kind of a, a solid coming with that that gets very, very high energy. These are ionized particles. It's to get your samples and they bounce off. And they get collected here and taken up and measured. So just a, a different approach, a little different energy range, but again, um, a very simple process. And this is, uh, shows, I think, a really nice example. If you wonder what the heck we do with any of these things, okay, airports, that's nice. But actually, you can take a, a tomato or an apple, put it under your desi. So here's your high energy coming down uh, particle. It hits here, bounces off, gets collected here, and measured here. What's the mass? Is there a pesticide? Is there a herbicide on uh, the outside of that tomato or that apple? really a quick way to get a determination of residual pesticides on plant materials. DART is kind of the same thing as DESI. 
in the, it's a dry interface. The previous one was a, a wet material that will tend to be bombarded. Here's a, a dry material. So again, you can put your material in here, it's not on bottom by ions, and it breaks it into pieces and you take a look at it. Low parts per million of explosive is muddy pond is one application. Probably don't have too much need for that one for us. These methods may have many charges for molecule, and that does mess up or complicate putting pieces together. It's nice when you get a molecular weight. You have one peak, one ion you're measuring. It's very straightforward. Uh, but when you start working with very large molecules, you got to do something, and it's typically blow them into pieces that you can end up measuring. So that's how we get ions. So we make ions in this way. And now we're going to measure those ions. So first we have to separate them and measure them. Then different types of mass analyzers, the magnetic sector, quadrupole, ion trap, time of flight, who knows what moves coming down the research pipeline. But again, different mass analyzers. This is what I mentioned to you before. We form our whole complex mixture of ions, a lot of them, we accelerate them down here, so ions are what is a mixture down here. And we change the magnetic field. So we can focus, maybe this ion we focus first, and we the magnetic flow field. This ion is focused, this ion is focused. So kind of one by one, we can go through and measure the, the different ions that are formed, magnetic sector. That's our oldest methodology. It's still in use a fair amount. Time of flight is another way. And this is a, an interesting one too. Here we've got a laser beam coming in here. Your sample comes in, you hit it with the laser beam, you put it into pieces, and then you have a charge here, so we get these particles moving out. And now, when you probably remember someplace, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay. So, you put, if your energy is always fixed, one half m v squared, so your velocity changes. So your small particles would have a very high velocity. The large particles will have a, a slower velocity. So this whole mixture of ions gets separated by how fast they move down the tube. Small ions go quickly, then the next, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so this is really, really neat as a, a technique goes, a very simple way to, to measure. But this only became available when we could measure things, you know, 10 to the minus six seconds and just differentiate between ions coming in at that small uh, separation. So that's, that's becoming our, our method of choice for small molecules. Magnetic sector was the first time of flight is uh, now probably the best innovation that we see. This filled in for some time, quadrupole. And in that case, you formed ions. If you get into your ion source, you put lots of ions. You've got a number of rods with different electrical charges on them. And you vary those charges. They actually make a certain mass without or without crashing into the wall or being lost otherwise. And so we can actually change these. So we get a only mass 100 comes out. In this case, you change, oh, something with a mass 10? Nope, that did be. Only a mass 1,000 did be. So this one makes it with the setup that you So you keep on changing the conditions here. If you can focus mass 10, that makes it down the pathway, mass 11, mass 12, and so on down the line. Oh, oh, this one I put in terms of magic. How's that? That means I don't have a foggiest idea how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there is a way, apparently, by having the proper charge in the proper places and whatever synchronized uh, charges, she collected items. Yeah. So they may be formed, may be drawn down a tube, but then they're collected. That mass, you can collect, collect, collect. So you can build up a lot of those on it. And then you inject it, and you can get better sensitivity. Because most of them, you've got kind of a throw flow, flow through the line. And if your concentration is too low, you don't see it. But if you can collect it for a while, then you can get enough to see it. So this technique in the ion trap is really good for sensitivity. 
So it's uh, that's its purpose, having sensitivity in your, in your analysis. But how it collects everything over there, like I say, I don't know, the foggiest idea. This is the last part of the mass spectrometer. And in this case, this is the detector. And that's the same across all the systems, no matter what method, LC, GC, um, any kind of mass spectrometer, interface separation, basically the process for a detector is the same. And so you basically have charged molecules coming out of your magnetic sector, your time of light, whatever. They come in and they get directed in a certain way. You hit this plate, this plate is high energy. So one ion comes in here, it gets multiplied by two. This two comes if this one gets to be four, four get to be 16, 16 get to be whatever 16 squared is, and swung down the line. So it's a photon or electron multiplier. So it gives you the sensitivity, which is one thing that makes the method really beautiful in terms of uh, ability to get low detection limits. The, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time with uh, data interpretation, but that's probably going to come in a greater part at the next uh, next class. And I'm interested in data interpretation, at least including it in this year. It was included last year, the year before, the year before, but it's, it is now. Because a lot of people are starting to use mass spectrometry. And just like gas chromatography, you get some result. Well, is that a valid result? What do you do with those results? And so often it's, it's simple to take a result and say, that's it. But that may be totally wrong. And you may get some really trash information out here if you don't know what you're doing. You can never accept what you're given by an instrument. The instrument has no common sense whatsoever. <laughs> you tell it what you want it to do and it does it, right or, right or wrong. And so that's why I'm, I'm putting a little bit more into a data interpretation. I'm getting one of the grad students' data, and it's going to be working uh, through that. So to show you what, what you can do with it. So data interpretation. I guess, what do we want to do? Do we want to identify something? Okay. If we want to identify something, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Here it happens to be... A listing of the ions that were formed after blowing a molecule up. And so this is the mass spectrum of this particular compound. What is it? There's a free charge uh, methane group. So here's 15. About 30% of our largest heat is made up of methane. C2H3. And so 27, mass 27. So one fragment is mass 15. Was 27, 43, and here's our, our uh, paradigm well here. So again, you can look at those pieces, and what is it? It's, it's basically acetone. So if you're going to put, find acetone in your sample, it would give you a spectrum exactly like that. And so it would have the largest peak at 43. It would show a molecular weight at 58. See, one of the neat things that has come about with the time of flight mass spectrometers is you can start getting high resolution. Um, in this previous, previous slide, this 43 could be made up of different combinations. It doesn't have to be made up only of this. There are other um, uh, molecules or parts of molecules that can go in here, atoms, I guess I should say, different atoms, that can total up to 43. When you get a higher resolution instrument, it gives you a mass of the four decimal places, meaning it's you can only be a CH3 CL that's uh, to give that to give that mass. So high resolution gives you a molecular formula. It tells you the number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and, you know, chlorine, bromine, whatever you happen to have in there. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's put together, but once you've got, I have an exact molecular formula, it makes life much, much easier for identification. And so the high resolution, and this is an example, 
is thymosolution carbon monoxide and nitrogen. So carbon monoxide and nitrogen out there. They both have the, the same mass, N2 and this, but they are separated greatly by this instrument. So another instrument, mass spectrometer, low resolution, would give you one peak, one sum of this. This one says, no, this is only made up of this, and that's made up of that. And that's, like I say, makes identification much, much easier. The computers now are these uh, mass spectrometers all come with a computer assisted searching. And so again, that's substituting your thinking <laughs> with a, an instrument doing the calculation for you. And I, I say use care because that's, that's really true. The mass spectrometers you'll see when we take a look at some data, they'll suggest identification. You'll have some peaks maybe coming out of a gas schematograph getting fed into the mass spectrometer. And it will say, oh, that looks like this compound. And it may, may not be, it, but it'll say, here's peak number 47, it is this molecule. The, the nice thing, it does give you uh, a probability of guessing right, because <laughs> you know, it gives you maybe a 50%. Well, I'm 50% sure of this. I wouldn't be too comfortable with that. If you've got a good identification, you've got all the right system, everything, you might get a 95. At 95% certain, that's okay. I'm pretty comfortable. I'm not 100% comfortable. And if your life counts on it, I, I'm not comfortable at all. And sometimes that's it. That's the case. So computer system searching, you're going to see that. We'll do a problem with it. But again, the machine gives you the best answer. And so... We will, like I say, spend spend more time with that. So let's look at interfacing a mass spectrometer to other techniques, such as gas chromatography. If we put a mixed compound into the mass spectrometer, mixture two, three compounds that gets entered, you're going to have a mess for a chromatogram. It's going to give you some total ions out of all three compounds mixed up. And that really makes it a challenge and oftentimes impossible to get a good identification. And so we like to do some kind of separation of your compounds, of your mixtures, before it goes into the mass spectrometer. And gas chromatography is certainly one technique, as is liquid chromatography. So let's put a gas chromatograph up, up front and interface it, use as a detector a mass spectrometer or use an HPLC to again look for uh, non-volatile compounds. Gas chromatography, volatile compounds. Liquid chromatography, non-volatile compounds. One of our problem with putting either a GC or an LC in front, you know, feeding the mass spectrometer, is how we maintain a vacuum in that system. So I've got a gas chromatograph, I'm having a carrier gas coming out of here, and it's going into the mass spectrometer. So I'm got a leak. It's just like a leak in that sense. I'm putting gas into that system. I really want a high vacuum in there. I don't want air inside my mass spectrometer because that will destroy my ability to measure ions. And so our challenge is how do we interface these instruments? Gas chromatography, carrier gas, liquid chromatography. We have a, a solvent whatever your solvent is. It may be an aqueous solvent. So one way or another, you've got to get rid of that solvent, get rid of that carrier gas <clears throat> to keep your mass spectrometer working properly. And so this has gotten easier with gas chromatography. At one time, your gas chromatograph had a column about the same size as my finger. So it was a large glass tube. And you'd have to have 20 to 30 milliliters per minute coming out of there, of your carrier gas, your mobile phase. You can't dump that into this, 10 to minus six millimeters of mercury. It'd just be impossible. That gas would expand so much, it would destroy your, your system. And so we just have very complex interface systems to try and get rid of that carrier gas. But as time has gone on, when gas chromatography gets to using these very tiny columns, these capillary columns, now, instead of being 20 to 40 mils per minute, it may be one mil 
of the nodular capillary column. So it's really easy to interface the GC with the mass spectrometer, just because the GC has such a slow or low gas flow through it. So we don't have really any inter interface anymore, no complex separations. We just butt them up together and hook them up, and, and it works. This, you know, when you think about this, um, a capillary column, that's one milliliter of, per minute of gas. That's about its, its flow rate. So we're getting about mil per minute coming out of the capillary column going into the mass spectrometer. Our mass spectrometer works under very high vacuum. That one mil per minute of gas coming out of the GC is equal to 10 to 6 mils per minute once it's expanded in the vacuum. So if we're only putting one mil into the GC per minute, if the, GC, the mass spectrometer has to pump out 10 to the 6 milliliters of, of gas. And so that means that we have to have good vacuum pumps in our mass spectrometer. So even capillary columns are a challenge, but they do they do work primarily because again instead of having a glass, this is a the old glass tube, twenty mils per minute coming in here directly going in, and all the effluent from the column goes in here. It's bombarded by electrons, goes through a quadrupole, gets focused out here to the detector, and comes out here. Well, with that being a capillary column, life is much 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 easier. We get better data, better identifications. I've, I've already gone over this with you, and that's uh, rather impressive to me when I focused on these two compounds and the separation here. Because then when you talk about gas from a drug, we said, this is what the GC printing, the orange one. But in fact, that orange is the sum of these two compounds. But they're only separated by 0 0.05 seconds. And the mass spectrometer can say, I get one set, so it blows. So let's say you take a mass spectrum here, it blows everything into pieces. Well, there's going to be pieces from this compound, pieces from that compound, but they're going to be formed at different rates. And so by mass spectrometry, we can actually separate those two compounds and we could quantify those two compounds. That's really Im impressive. And one of the things, again, that uh, <laughs> research have done, has done for us is make life easier. Now, if your instructor were here, I, I would uh, comment a little bit more about HPLC, but I can't harass her if she's not here. But anyway, because uh, I'm a gas chromatography person, and Baran is an LC person. I always talk about how archaic LC is in comparison to GC, the separation powers and so on. And so she puts up with me. Kind of. <laughs> but it is, uh, LC is really one of the hottest in methodologies these days. Because, um, you know, gas chromatography came along much, much earlier. It's much easier to work with one milliliter of gas that it is a million, I'm sorry, a milliliter of a solvent, like the are going see. It's tough, tough to manage. Yeah. So our carrier flows coming out of LC are 100 to 1,000 what they are in the GC. So our challenge in LC is, is again, getting rid of all the solvent that gets pumped into the system. And so you basically look at different ways to try and separate the solvent from the compounds that's being carried into the system. Um, and these are different types of mass spectrometers, and they all differ in terms of how they get sampled into the MS without putting all that solvent into the system. LC electrospray is a fairly common way to, to go about this. So here we've got our effluent. So it's coming from an LC column. The LC effluent comes down here. Here's where we put about 4,000 volts right on the end of this. And it tends to bust that gap, yeah, that liquid stream up. It tends to turn it into droplets. So, so each of these are droplets. So we're atomized, essentially, your LC effluent. And so this is one of the drops up here. 
that's a mixture of ions, of fragments, here, it's under a vacuum. And so it's under a vacuum, so the solvent tends to evaporate as it comes across here. So these droplets are evaporating the liquid, leaving you ultimately only the ions. So they've worked out different systems. This is one way. There's spray them into a vacuum chamber, let them evaporate. They, put, they have a charge on them, so they're being drawn towards the, the inlet to the mass drama. So they tend to go this way, like I say, your solid tends to come into this chamber and be drawn off by, by vacuum pumps. But it's a much more complex system than it is in terms of gas chromatography. This is uh, another system. It's, it's very, very similar to uh, the other one. And so here we have, in, in this case, a capillary tube coming in. This is under atmospheric pressure. The whole thing's under atmospheric pressure. Here we have something like 7,000 volts here. So anything that's being drawn in is capillary tube. And that can actually be a, a, a luminary. They use these types of mass spectrometers to go up in balloons and sample the atmosphere or go around uh, you know, the city monitoring pollution because it's drawing samples from the environment in here. And it charges in here. It's the ionized molecules to come out here going to the, the mass spectrometer. So this is a, a nice uh, technique. I use it for a different methodology. I'm interested in what people, um, I guess, exhale. How's, how's that? Whenever you uh, swallow a food, you'll always have an exhale breath. I think I probably show this later on. You always exhale. And that exhale is what comes up past the olfactory region and says, oh, smells like cherry. <laughs> so this whole idea of being released in the mouth, transferred into the airstream, was how much of the sensing goes on. So I'm interested in what's in the air, in the air in your mouth. And so we actually put these in people's mouths, we put them up the nose, <laughs> and we can sample what people have taken into the mouth. And I think I've got a picture of that coming up uh, probably next uh, next lecture. So fascinating in what you can do. I can, I can go ahead and like to say, detect what's given up in your mouth that actually gets sensed for you forming an opinion that product. Mass spectrometry, individual peaks, mammogram. So you know, you'll have an, an LC. So your LC is feeding your mass spectrometer. But the LC has the ability to convert all of these ions, whatever ions are being formed, into a peak. So you see peaks. But they're the sums of all the ions that a molecule will go into. And so you get what I call a total ion chromatogram that's generated over time in your, in your LC and less. But the whole time, the mass spectrometer is bombarding, 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 counting, sorting all the ions. Then that gives you a trace across all of your compounds that you can use for identification. Quantitative analysis. Well, you know, this is a little more complicated. It takes a little bit longer. Let's knock it off a minute early, and we'll do it next time instead. So uh, we also take advantage of using stable isotopes for labeling compounds. And the mass spectrometer can find those stable isotopes that we don't have any other instrument to use for it. So let's call it quits here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>